Anthony was born in Surrey, England. He was educated at Oxford University and holds a master's degree in theology and modern languages. He is the author of numerous books, including Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian, The Doctrine of the Trinity. He is the author of many theological articles, papers, and currently is the editor of the free magazine Focus on the Kingdom. And you can find uh, that right here on Focus on the Kingdom. You can sign up to get the newsletters as well right into your inbox. And I would encourage you to do that. It's a wonderful magazine to stay connected. And you can uh, find more information on Anthony. If you visit Wikipedia, I will put the link here in the chat or maybe Carlos could as well. Let's see here. You can find a little bit more out about Anthony and, and all that he does. And so, welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Tracy. How are you doing this evening? You're looking sharp? Fine, yeah. I dressed up, you know, for the occasion. Don't normally wear a tie. Oh, uh, I appreciate but, that. Uh, that's good. No, I, I enjoyed that immensely, by the way. Maurizio and an excellent translation. Yes, yes. And uh, I really think if, you, if we listen to, you know, what he shared and what I hear a lot of the ladies share in my Bible studies, it's a big thanks to you for all the work that you do with your writing and the book. You've been doing this for years. How long have you been writing? When did, when did your first book come out? You know, I've almost forgotten that, but it must be <laughs> 30 years now, I think. Yes, I've been doing it a long time. Forgotten the exact dates. You know, when you get as old as I am at 87, you tend not to remember things as well as you did. I warn you, that will come to you in about 50, 60, 70 years, of course. <laughs> I say flatteringly. <laughs> very but flattering. No, I, I'm, I'm very thrilled and excited to hear Maurizio's story. I mean, that is just remarkable. I, lo I love it. I love hearing those stories. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And uh, as I was saying, as they say in Russian, I curtsy low to you or I bow low to you for all of your work. <laughs> and uh, it really is a blessing, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, a lot of your material, a lot of it is translated into many other languages. Right. Yes. And you don't, everybody doesn't have to go to every country or this or that. No, no. Share the work. You've already done the work. It's available online on your website. A lot of it's on my website as well. Yeah, and all people have to do is share it. They don't need to write a book. They don't need to go somewhere. You don't need to buy an airplane ticket. That's right. Just share the work that's been done. That's and right. you can have uh, a lot of good evangelism opportunity with that. Absolutely. You're talking about the miracle of the internet, which our mm -hmm. forefathers would not believe that I can mm -hmm. sit and chat with you, you know, so clearly. This is absolutely <laughs> miraculous. It makes the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom a reality in a way it never was before. And I'm sure Paul would have used it if he had the opportunity. Totally he would. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm always blessed to hear your kingdom thoughts, whether I was in a front row of a class or right on the screen here with you right in front of me. And I'm grateful for your faithful and continual yeah. service and that you don't see retiring from your calling as an option. Uh, no, no. no as as I, one, I don't know no. how anyone could. I don't know how you could, but I, I told the story about you, by the way, and it's very vivid in my mind. You were in the front row of that class at Atlanta Bible well, College, Oregon, 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 Illinois at that time. Mm -hmm. And you seemed to be ecstatic, I think is the only word I can say. When we talked about the kingdom, that is the key, as we're going to see in my presentation and the others, the key to everything. If you don't talk about the kingdom, you don't sound like Jesus, period. So be exactly. warned. That's the point we're trying to make. Well, exactly. And um, I, I do appreciate your kingdom yeah. service and that you truly are a kingdom servant doing the master's work day in and day out. You, you continue to do it. And um, I'm just looking, more? Anthony, yeah. at the chat. Um, yeah. uh, Edwin is, is in the chat. So to our viewers, if you have anything to say, uh, yes. you can share with Edwin in the chat. And thank you again, Edwin, for your service mm -hmm. and Marvelous. for putting together the video for us. And it's really interesting, Anthony, uh, you had such an impact on Edwin's life. Yes. Uh, and yes. after you speak, Wendy is going to be speaking. And she was in the class with me uh, in um, your kingdom class when we were at OBC as well. And so it's, I think it's a real honor for 
you yeah. to have your students so in love with these yes. truths and with Jesus' teachings, especially this exactly. kingdom gospel. Absolutely right. And we're learning all the time. We do not think that any one of us is infallible. We want to hear from you. If we're saying something that you just, just don't think makes any sense, you let us know. We are very much open to discussion. But it's very hard to avoid the gospel of the kingdom unless you just throw the Bible in the trash. We don't want to do that. As long as you've got a Bible, the kingdom is the gospel. That's the point I'll be making. Amen. Amen. We'll bring up your notes here. Yep. And Thank we will you. have these available after uh, mm -hmm. the presentation on the web page as well. Good. And I will let you get started here. Okay, so much. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to suggest that if you have a pencil with you, that you would take note of these verses, because I'm hoping that you will convey some of what we say to your friends as you have opportunity. My title, Adam failed, but King Jesus, and we'll call him King Jesus the first and only, King Jesus and you, underline you, are going to succeed. The Bible, it seems to me, is a royal story in the light of the arrival of, of a king in England. Not that he is anything spiritually of significance, but kingship, royalty, and so on is somewhat in the news. Americans are very kind about that kind of thing. So this will fit in with your experience recently if you saw that incredible presentation of those people marching in London. So I'll read from the script and I may deviate here and there, but you will follow with great ease. Adam was created and commissioned to rule over the world which God had created for him and given him as his home. That's what we read in Genesis 128. 128 says that Adam is supposed to supervise the world, subdue the world, take charge of it. And particularly in Psalm 2, verses 7 to 12. And I put in parentheses here a very important point. What Christ is promised, we Christians are promised also. That's what you find in Psalm 8, 4 to 6, and particularly in Revelation 2, 26 and 27. The power and the authority that Jesus has been given by the Father, Jesus generously shares with us. Adam was created to be king of the world, I say. The Bible is from Genesis to Revelation, a royal drama. Man was supposed to have everything under his feet, under his control. And look what has happened. Turn on the news, doesn't matter what news station you're familiar with. What do they talk about incessantly, day and night? Only one subject. Who's going to take charge of this chaos? The answer that I'm offering you tonight is that only Messiah King Jesus. Messiah means king. Messiah King Jesus will be able to fix this, to do this. The nations are warned in Psalm 2, warned to pay attention and to obey King Jesus, because if they don't, they're not going to exist very long. They're going to be put out of commission. So growing up, the young Jesus, think of the history of Jesus as a young Jew. The young Jesus was fascinated by the Hebrew Bible, what we call our Old Testament, which is really nearly two thirds of the whole Bible. Think of that, nearly two thirds of the entire Bible. You'd better be knowing that Old Testament well, otherwise you're going to misunderstand the rest of it. Jesus knew that he needed help. And you, listening this evening, if you're a believer, you are it. Jesus was born into a Jewish home, not American, not British, not Chinese, a Jewish home. And in Luke 132, this marvelous text, this verse announced and reminded him of his royal destiny. Here it goes. The Lord God, the one God about which, about whom Mauricio is just speaking, the Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his father, David. You didn't know that David is mentioned about 1,200 times in the Bible. He's massively important, King David. And Jesus then is going to reign over the house of Israel forever. For that see 2 Samuel 7. These are verses which if you're explaining the faith to your friends, you're going to use all the time. Later on, they tried to make him king, John 6, 15. But Jesus escaped to the hills. It wasn't yet the right time. 
When the same issue was raised in Acts 1 6, Jesus did not know the exact span of time before the second coming, which is in the future to us, of course. Growing up, the young Jesus appeared to be a kind of Mozart of theology. Can you imagine that? Totally fascinated by the scriptures, reading scripture, he saw that he, as Messiah King, was the one planned by God to announce the future. The future, which is the first and only successful one world government. As you read in Isaiah, or Isaiah, should I say, for our American audience, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, those three passages, and a mass of other stuff, which would take hours for us to read through, give you that one world government. The job of Jesus was to succeed where Adam had failed. See, that's so smart. Jesus could see, look, Adam got this wrong. I'm going to get this right. That's the way the story goes. Imagine understanding yourself as a solution to the whole world's problems. Jesus desired to share that destiny with others. And that's where you, capital Y-O-U, come in. And you're going to see as we go through this paper why that's so. But the counter-narrative, you see, there's a devil with a counter-narrative, a fake news narrative, goes very deceptively like this. Here's what I learned if I learned anything in the Church of England, which was very, very little, that's 60 years ago. Your objective goes like this, it's heaven at death. This is what churches have talked about, propagandized incessantly and effectively. But heaven, as a place you go to when you die, is a drastic diversion an obfuscation, a darkening confusion of your destiny. Your destiny is defined and promoted by the Christian gospel or good news about the kingdom. How Jesus not only died for you, and this is the major point I'm trying to make, not only did he die and rise for you, but he is now training you to rule the world. With him, when he returns at his parousia, that's the Greek word, and I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation for Greek words if I use them, because our Greek-speaking friends enjoy that. When he returns at his parousia to bring in this promised kingdom, that's the entire story. The devil now has worked hard to cancel that staggeringly interesting story of the world and its destiny. The devil knows that he's going to be defeated, and so his object is to try to see that you fail. He wants you to fail, that you miss out on your destiny. Hence Luke 8, 12. And this verse is recently come to us as so very fascinatingly important. Luke 8, 12, this is how it goes. Satan has this one key objective and you are to work hard in the opposite direction. Note how this brilliant intelligence report from Jesus goes. It says this, when anyone hears the gospel message about the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19, the devil comes to snatch away that kingdom gospel message from your heart or mind. Now catch this, so that you cannot believe in that kingdom gospel message and be smart. No, no, and be saved. I want my Unitarian friends to grasp this because a lot of them have not seen that the kingdom of God gospel is central. Yes, be saved. That's what Jesus said. Salvation, according to Messiah Jesus, the rabbi, depends on an intelligent grasp of the kingdom. Don't say, well, I, you know, I vaguely believe that Jesus is coming back. It's not enough. You need an intelligent grasp of the gospel of the kingdom. So you and I are commanded to obey Jesus. I hope that's clear. There's so much unnecessary talk about faith and works and what is salvation all about. Not so hard. You and I are commanded to obey Jesus. And Jesus first command. Okay, let's look at the first command. What is the first command? It's in Mark 1. Mark's very, very smart. He begins his gospel by saying the beginning of the gospel. That's a good place to start. And in chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, here's what Jesus is reported as having said. Change your mind. Repent, that's what that means, and believe. You are commanded, you don't have an option to say, well, I'll believe it if I feel like it. No, no, no. You are to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Believe, that is, in your destiny 
as a co-regent, a co-ruler with Jesus to manage the world. I'm going to bring you a quotation in the next page that you'll find, I, I think, quite staggering. Okay, page two, let's scroll a little bit further. That kingdom will, will be enforced and come into power when he returns. I want to give you this illuminating, I think, almost unheard of statement from a famous Scottish preacher. It doesn't mean I believe everything exactly that Scottish preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was very famous. But this is a staggeringly interesting quotation. He said this, we shall dwell in these glorified bodies, as our bodies in that future day will be, on a glorified earth. This is one of the great Christian doctrines that has been almost entirely forgotten and ignored. Unfortunately, said Martin or Jones, the Christian church, I speak generally, does not believe this. I want you to ponder this, go over it and think about it, and therefore doesn't teach it. It, the Christian church, as he generally knew it, has lost its hope. That's being hopeless, by the way. This explains why it spends most of its time trying to improve life in this world, preaching politics. Now he says this, quotation again, but something remarkable is going to be true of us, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 3, quote from Paul, dare any of you Christian brothers and sisters, if you have a matter against another, dare any of you, I dare you, don't do it. Don't go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Now the statement, do you not know that the saints, brothers and sisters in, in the true church, members of the Christian church, don't you know the saints are going to govern or rule the world? If that strikes you as new, I'm rejoicing. I want you to understand that. Paul said that, not I. We are destined to rule with Christ over the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to be big-headed about that. We're simply to admire and accept and believe what God chose as our destiny. Martin Lord Jones went on to say this. This is Christianity. This is the truth by which the New Testament Christians lived. It was because of this that they were not afraid of their persecutors. They knew that this glory was coming. This fact about the future kingdom and their part in it was the secret of their endurance, their patience, and their triumphing over everything that was said against them. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his uh, commentary on Romans, it's a marvelous statement. I recommend you read that over and over again. Show it to your friends. So I go on then, Matthew 24, 14, you all know this verse, many of you. We read this, this gospel, not vaguely this gospel, when you say gospel, you always want to say the gospel about the kingdom, because then you will begin to recover what's been lost. This gospel about the kingdom of God will be heralded, Jesus said, in the whole wide world for all the nations. And then the end of the present evil age will come. That's to say, then and only then, Jesus will come back to inaugurate that kingdom, which was the subject of his own gospel, the kingdom of God. It seems to us, and this is me now, it seems to us that the evangelical world, and I hasten to add also a great number of Unitarian colleagues and friends and brothers and sisters, is in a tremendous muddle about what the gospel is. Churchgoers do not speak of the gospel of the kingdom, but Jesus always did, with unrelenting emphasis. Jesus was a totally one-track mind person that tends to make for success, by the way, in any field. That model of the kingdom spells chaos for millions of would-be believers. How can they respond to Mark chapter 1, 14 to 15, which was Jesus' first and fundamental command, what you must believe and do? How can they respond to that? If you want to be a Christian, how can anyone respond to Jesus if they do not know what the kingdom of God is. They remain baffled and confused at first base, and they're unable to build their Christianity on the words of Jesus, which is the only safe way to build it. I want to intersperse now and, and just digress a moment to tell you that Billy Graham, against whom I have nothing personally, but Billy Graham says this in his book on how to be born again. 
I'm diverting now from my script just to, just to add this. Billy Graham says, you don't need to understand the gospel to believe it. What? With great respect, I disagree with that. You have to accept it, but you don't have to believe it. To me, that is simply nonsense at any level. So let's rehearse the royal kingdom story for you. First, Paul's horror and protest over confusion about the gospel of the kingdom. Here's what Paul said. Some of you think you're reigning now. What, Paul said? Would to God that you were reigning as kings now, so that we, all of us, might be reigning as kings with you. Do you hear that? Paul knew what that destiny was, and some of them had fallen into the atrocious error of saying that the king is vague, kingdom is really kingship in some vague sense. It's just a good feeling, being a good chap or whatever. It isn't. It's firstly and foremost, as I'm going to go on to explain to you, that event which will begin the kingdom at the second coming. So Paul is here coming against a huge timetable error. The seed of amillennialism, so-called, and postmillennialism, and also preterism, which is the idea that the kingdom really came in 70 AD, which is completely nonsensical. So any unclarity in those three uh, despised, from my point of view, point of view, are millennialism, post-millennialism, president, any of those represent an unclarity about when the saints will rule, when the saints go marching in, and they very possibly and probably literally will one day go marching in, probably from the area of Sinai, where Jesus will gather all the saints. So did any of you think when you sign up for college, you expect to graduate that same day? Of course not. One fatal mistake is to think that the kingdom in the Bible means some abstract reign, kingship, other abstract idea, rather than a real kingdom. King Charles III in our day is king of a kingdom, which is not just a nice thought in his heart, or in the, th in the hearts of his uh, subjects. A kingdom, I want to tell you, without territory is not in the Bible a kingdom in any sense. All this is more than obvious from the Hebrew Bible that nearly two thirds of the Bible we call the Old Testament, what we really unfortunately call the Old Testament should be the Hebrew Bible. If you are going to misunderstand the Bible, you begin by misunderstanding the Old Covenant. I learned that in theological college. They said to me, Anthony, if you misunderstand the Old Covenant, the Old Testament writings, you're bound to misunderstand the New. That is absolutely true. All right, so moving on to page three, Tracy, if we could. There we go. Thank you. This is marvelous. The absence of the gospel is glaringly obvious. I want to make my point now. An article in Christianity Today showed that most Christians cannot define the gospel if asked to do so. In an article called Good News or Bad News, August the 6th, 2005. I want to suggest to you that that is nothing short of a disaster. Can one have accepted the gospel can one possibly have accepted Jesus if one cannot articulate the gospel? I think not. If one doesn't know and understand what the gospel is and cannot speak of it with eternity, it seems to me clear that one has accept, it, it, is it clear, I'm asking a question, is it clear then that you've accepted it and understood it? I think not. I think the situation must be perilous and dangerous. And I stress the word dangerous at that point. Jesus did say, and I'm diverting here a second, when he comes back, will he find the faith on the earth? Jesus looked at the way in which we human beings tend to get everything wrong, almost instinctively. He said, I doubt that this faith is going to even be around when I come back. Well, I think it will be, but it might be seriously reduced. So let's go on. Another series of articles in Christianity Today allowed nine leading evangelical leaders to define the Christian gospel. What's the good news was the name of that article, it's February the 7th, 2000. There was an extraordinary variety of explanations. Nothing was said about the kingdom of God. No definition of the gospel of the kingdom was offered. Isn't that astonishing? 
Now this modern statement from one called Mortimer Arius, a professor of missiology. He's a professional student and teacher of missions. And he conceded the point that I'm trying to get across this evening. He said this, listen carefully, please. When I left the seminary, I had no clear about the clear idea about the kingdom of God. I had no place in my theology for the parousia, the second coming. What? I had no concerns about the future. Then he says this, I think, very much to the point. Thousands of books are printed and circulated every year on evangelization. Most of these books fall into the category of how-to manuals for churches, devising plans, strategies, methodologies, goals. Then he says our traditional many theolo theologies, the plan of salvation, the four spiritual laws and so on, do not do justice, he's being understated here, do not do justice to the whole gospel. Not all of this activity or activism is a sign of health or creativity. I say it's a sign of apostasy, of having fallen away from the true, true Jesus. The good news of the kingdom is not the usual way, Mortimer Arias says, it's not the usual way we describe the gospel and evangelization. The kingdom of God has practically disappeared. What? Disappeared from evangelistic preaching and has been ignored by traditional evangelism. So then you're saying, Mortimer Arias, Christianity has disappeared. He practically is saying that. I want this to be a concern for all of you listening tonight. And yet plainly and obviously, the Bible's gospel is about the kingdom. Jesus came into Galilee preaching God's gospel. That means the gospel coming from God, not God, good news about God, but God speaking to the world in terms of the gospel. And here were the words, repent and believe the gospel about the kingdom. Mark 1, 14 to 15. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is approaching. Repent, turn around, be converted, reorientate yourself and believe that gospel. That's a command. You have no option. You're to believe that gospel about the kingdom. That is reminiscent, incidentally, of these words. Abraham believed God and it was counted, reckoned to him as making him right. Wouldn't you like to be right? Then you start by believing in the kingdom. So Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel concerning the kingdom of God for conversion. Not to be clever, not to be smart, not to be intellectual, but to become a Christian. The gospel was preached ahead of time to Abraham. That is wonderful. I really do recommend and uh, applaud the founders of the so-called General Conference, Church of God Abrahamic Faith, of what they rightly call themselves. When they started, they discovered this gospel of the kingdom and founded a denomination back in around 1830 or 40. It's all based on the story of Abraham and David and Jesus. That's a brilliant, it is so brilliant, I say, that Mark labels this foundational information the beginning of the gospel. I discovered that the other day, within recent months. Mark 1 1 says the beginning. I remember so well in England there was a children's program where the announcer always said at the beginning, Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. You want to start at the beginning and you're not doing it. If your preacher and pastor is not preaching on the kingdom of God extensively, you need to tap him on the shoulder and say, why don't you sound like Jesus? So why shouldn't we follow Mark's and Jesus' well-defined scheme for evangelization? In Matthew 13, 19, we find the gospel is called the word of the king. Do your friends know that when it just says the word of God or the word of the king, it means that the gospel of the kingdom. People think the word is vague in the Bible. I got the word of God here means I got the Bible. That's false. The word of the kingdom is expressly the central gospel message, known as the word, known as the word of God, not vaguely the Bible, which is called the scriptures, often in the Bible. So not own any old word, but the word about the kingdom. Same as the gospel of the kingdom. Now, please catch this word carefully. It's the seed or germ 
of immortality to be sown in the hearts and minds of people. See, I'm happy to be married to an expert gardener. She's a master gardener, Barbara is. So I've learned something about seeds. If you put a seed in the ground, if you treat it well, it comes up as a plant. It bears fruit. That is the analogy that Jesus used in the parable of the sower. So the parable of the sower is everything in terms of understanding. So it's only when they understand and grasp and embrace and accept that gospel of the kingdom that they can possibly be accepting Jesus. Now, I don't want to be hard on Billy Graham, but I want to quote to you from a book by Billy Graham called How to Be Born Again. And he says this, you don't have to understand the gospel to accept it. You have to believe it, but you don't need to understand it. I think that's just false. That is confusion. And I shouldn't say things that are negative in a way about an icon, but please think critically for your own benefit. The gospel of the kingdom can only be accepted if you understand what's being asked of you. The Bible doesn't speak vaguely ever about accepting Jesus, asking Jesus into your heart. Rather, it speaks about God and Jesus accepting us, but only when we understand and receive God's gospel about the kingdom. Check that back. Do not believe a word I say, but I think you'll find that compelling if you look at it. Okay, page four coming up, Tracy, if you would. Move it up for me. Thank you so much. Now back to that series of articles in Christianity Today, just for a moment. Nine leading spokesmen attempted to articulate the gospel. It was an extraordinary confusion, an extraordinary lack of any reference to the main agenda in the gospel as Jesus preached it, the gospel about the kingdom. This prompted a letter from somebody called Charles Tabor, who was a professor, a professional uh, emeritus, I mean, see, he was retired, from World Mission of the Emmanuel School of Religion in Johnson City, Tennessee. He said this, I think this is a fascinating statement. He says, I read with great interest the nine statements attempting to answer the question, what's the good news? I'm amazed and dismayed to find not even a passing mention of the theme which was the core of Jesus' gospel in three of the four accounts, the kingdom of God. Every one of those statements that I read reflects the individualistic reduction of the gospel that plagues American evangelicalism. Now, I want you to ask of yourself, is it plaguing your inability to be effective because you haven't defined the gospel? You see, if one hasn't grasped that the gospel is about the kingdom, what has one grasped of the New Testament? This gospel of the kingdom is the ABC, the foundation of everything, the rock. The essential gospel message concerns what Jesus called the king. Of course, because that's reversing what Adam got wrong and Jesus and you are going to get right. So what's the kingdom? So then, what does this mean to believe in the gospel of the kingdom? As Jesus commanded in his first commandment in Mark 1. The answer is not difficult. None of this is complicated. If one traces the kingdom through Mark, well, one will find that it's obviously a kingdom which has not yet come. It would be very strange, you show your friends, I hope, for Mark to write a document in which he intends you to understand that the kingdom came with the ministry in the past, the ministry of the historical Jesus, and then at the end of the gospel to record that Joseph of Arimathea, who from Matthew's account we know was a Christian disciple, Joseph of Arimathea was still waiting for the kingdom of God after the end of the ministry of Jesus, Mark 15, 43. So had jo Joseph missed the kingdom? Come on now. Are we to understand that the kingdom of God had come in some radically fundamental sense with the ministry of Jesus, and yet Joseph, as a Christian, was still waiting for it? It makes no sense at all. It makes nonsense. The fact is that Mark did not intend us to believe that the kingdom of God had come, except in the limited and different sense that the spirit of that kingdom was being displayed in the preaching of the kingdom, and it was being displayed in advance, so to speak, 
kingdom, life, and all that's fine. I agree with all of that. But the kingdom of, of itself, in itself, had not come. That's why in the Lord's Prayer and the previous book of Daniel is where you should always begin with evangelism. Because, uh, because everybody who knows anything at all of the Bible knows your kingdom come. The preaching of the kingdom was, of course, in full swing as the objective of Christianity. And we point out that for Jesus, your kingdom come, of course, means the kingdom hasn't come. You don't pray for the coming of the kingdom if it's already come. In addition to that, we lay the foundation of the kingdom message in Matthew, the first gospel, and John the Baptist in the third chapter introduces the idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those are, of course, exactly interchangeable ideas. There are schools of thought out there on the internet which try to explain the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of heaven. That is utterly and absolutely false and confusing. They're obviously the same item. Of course, these two terms are entirely synonymous. No difference at all. They mean exactly the same thing. Any system of theology which tries to tell you the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of heaven is introducing a fatal confusion into the teaching of Jesus from the start. John the Baptist introduced the gospel of the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Matthew uses that phrase kingdom of heaven. He's the only one who does that because the Jews wanted to avoid using the name God. But Matthew also uses the phrase kingdom of God as well sometimes. He announced that it was at hand and commanded. It's all about obedience. Are you going to obey Jesus or not? Make up our minds right now for salvation. Jesus commanded repentance and belief in that gospel of the kingdom. Then he talked, Jesus did, about flee, or John the Baptist rather, even before Jesus. He talked about fleeing from the wrath to come. That's the negative side of the future kingdom. And then he defined, move up to the next page if you would for us. There we go. And he defined the kingdom as that time when judgment I like Tracy's introduction where she has that man with the gavel and he's pronouncing the beginning of a, a lawsuit. The judgment will decide between the good and the bad. The good will go into the barn, B-A-R-N, or the bonfire. It will be the time when the wheat, the good seed, please concentrate on that word seed, are ushered into the barn of the kingdom and the wicked are destroyed like the chaff, Matthew 3, 2 to 12, in the lake of fire. The lake of fire, of course, is a destructive punishment, not an endless, torturous hellfire. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's the coming of judgment to destroy the wicked at the return of Jesus and the coming of the kingdom to be inaugurated at that time at the future spectacular parousia, or coming of Jesus. That fact about the kingdom is clearly laid out in Matthew 3. That, of course, is the beginning of the New Testament documents. And we learn the facts about the kingdom progressively. If it therefore makes a considerable nonsense, I'm using my British understatement there, a considerable nonsense and chaos of the gospel from the start, if one fails to tell the public that the kingdom is essentially, primarily, predominantly that kingdom which is going to come when Jesus returns. People talk vaguely about being born again, even as a young children, as young children. But they tell us nothing of any response of the kingdom gospel. Another good place to start would be Luke 19. This is a favorite parable of mine. Luke 19, verses 11 to 27, where precisely that question about the presence or future of the kingdom was raised. The people, it says there, thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately, implying, of course, that it had not yet appeared in the ministry of Jesus. But they thought it was going to come right then. Why? Because, the text says, Jesus was standing near Jerusalem. That's the capital of the kingdom, for goodness sake. This isn't difficult. 
And it should be obviously clear then, not only to that audience, but to us, that the kingdom is something headquartered or will be headquartered in Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, because the king, Messiah, was standing near to Jerusalem, it would appear reasonable for those people to suppose that the kingdom of God, that's to say the royal empire, the Davidic royal empire promised by all the prophets and the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, the land promise, it would be reasonable to suppose that the kingdom was going to appear immediately. Well, of course. So what did Jesus do? Did he say, folks, you missed it. Did he say the kingdom is really not an empire in the Davidic sense at all? It's just the reign of God in your hearts. It's just being a good person, ethics and good behavior now, being a good person. It's just a ministry of exorcism and the casting out of demons, not devils, by the way, in the King James. There's no such thing as devils in the Bible, casting out of demons. And so you've misunderstood the kingdom. Did Jesus say that? Did Jesus say, don't expect the kingdom to come in some Davidic empire sense? Did Jesus say anything like that? Well, of course not. He most carefully and specifically said the kingdom of God, as you correctly understand it, indicated by my proximity to Jerusalem, and I'm king of that kingdom, and I'm going to rule the world from the capital of the kingdom in Jerusalem. That kingdom, Jesus said, is not going to come immediately. In fact, I'm going to leave. I'm the nobleman, note the royalty element again, the royal person. I'm going off to heaven to acquire possession of that kingdom to be authorized, that's to say, uh, to rule in that kingdom. And then I'm going to come back and establish that kingdom and reward. Please notice the reward. Christianity receives its reward. And I'm going to reward my followers with positions of executive power in the kingdom, like authority over five cities, ten cities, and so on. I'm going to say, oh, what about this verse? I don't relish this verse in any way, but it's right there. I'm going to slay my enemies. Who are they? Those who did not want me to reign over them. That's Luke 19, twice there in 14 and 27. There's a lady theologian whom I won't name out of respect for her, but she says, well, we know Jesus couldn't have said that. Well, I'm not in that business of deciding that the Bible is wrong there. So please linger as you think about that statement. This is exactly the picture we had in Matthew 3. The destruction of the wicked. The ushering in of the good seed. I want you now, if you will, to concentrate on that word seed of the kingdom which is the royal personnel and family, the royal family, into the kingdom of God when Jesus returns in power and glory. This, I want to tell you, hasn't happened yet. Okay, the church's problem includes our Unitarian communities too. Firstly, if we lose track of this easy framework of the kingdom teaching in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call the synoptics, we lose the entirety of the Christian faith. Churches constantly lament the fact that they're not doing as well as they would hope to. It's hardly surprising. They've tended to drop the gospel as Jesus preached it. They've dropped the vocabulary of Jesus, which was always about the gospel, about the kingdom of God, as we see most clearly in the summary statements given by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew 4.23, we read that Jesus went about all of Galilee proclaiming, heralding the gospel concerning the kingdom of God. Again, in 935, there's a summary statement holding together the whole book of Matthew so that we would never, ever forget that the gospel is about the kingdom, the king and the kingdom. So, firstly, churches have abandoned or tended to abandon that gospel for some so-called Pauline gospel. That is a fatal error. The idea that Paul preached a gospel different from Jesus is the quick road to chaos and confusion in all Bible study. 
So there's no Pauline gospel. There's no such thing as a Pauline gospel because Paul did not make the fatal mistake of dropping the kingdom from the gospel, as I'll point out in, in a little bit more detail. Secondly, if on a rare occasion an evangelical preacher does mention the precious phrase gospel of the kingdom, he almost certainly collapses that future kingdom immediately by concentrating almost exclusively on the present, what he calls the presence of the kingdom. Now, granted that the spirit and the power of the kingdom is being demonstrated in the ministry of Jesus in advance of the coming of the kingdom, but that's not where the emphasis is. The presence of the kingdom is not where the interest mainly lies in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not at all. Let's point out that the kingdom in Mark, if you just take the Gospel of Mark, is always something future. In Mark 9.47, it's the kingdom which comes when the wicked are destroyed. That hasn't happened yet, just as we saw in Matthew 3. In Mark 11.10, this beautiful statement, the people who were Jewish and fully understood what I'm saying here, the people shout with passionate enthusiasm for their national hope. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. You know, Americans are wonderfully patriotic people. I'm amazed as I watch all of the argument about who's going to be in charge, who's going to get, get elected and so on. Americans are tremendous patriots. They love the Constitution, or some of them do. The Bible is our Christian Constitution. Are you passionately excited about the coming kingdom of our father David? Now, let's note this interesting idea, the kingdom of God within you. I'm talking from experience now, 60 years ago, interviewing numerous members of the Salvation Army on my way to teaching languages at what I would call your American school in London, as I did some 50 years ago, I used to inquire. I, I love to talk about this subject. So I said to them, how do you define the Christian gospel? The invariable and only response was to offer Luke 17, 21, badly mistranslated in the King James Version, which I don't recommend you use as your standard text, with disastrous consequences. And the King James Version says, the kingdom of God is within you. That was the only verse these dear people understood or mentioned. That may mean the King, Jesus, was in their midst. That's possible, but still unlikely. Much more likely, the sense is, a reference to the future kingdom. When the kingdom does come in the future, Jesus said it will be all over and visible. It will not be localized. It will not be a question of saying, as Jesus warned against, look here, it's over here, look there, it's rush off and find it in the wilderness. That's not what the kingdom will be. No, the kingdom of God will be massively evident, Jesus said, public, like lightning, flashing the side of the other. Isn't that beautiful? 1724 of Luke. That's what the kingdom of God will be like, all over and visible. It's the kingdom of God which Jesus, standing close to the royal capital of the kingdom, Jerusalem, hasn't yet even but obtained it in Luke 19. He went off to heaven to get it. He had to go off to heaven as the noble Messiah to acquire that kingdom and then, as he will, return to establish it. The kingdom begins then at the stupendous event of the second coming. In my Church of England days, the first 18 years of my life, I remember no sermons at all on the kingdom of God, not one. Heaven was our assumed goal and our vocabulary was laced with references to heaven at death as the place old people passed away to. And I hear Unitarians today talking about passing away. Don't do it. You're promoting a lie if you talk about passing away. Rather talk about falling asleep in death and you'll promote the idea of the sleep of death. Okay, page seven coming up, please, Tracy. This was the taken for granted, never discussed point and objective of our so-called Christianity. 
I would add here too, we used to think that Americans were strange that they took a Bible and they went to church. We didn't do that. It would be a stupid American fundamentalist thing. We didn't do that. We were not studying the Bible at all. We never talked about it, but we listened to it for 10 minutes sermon every Sunday. But 98% of the references to the kingdom of God in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are to the kingdom to be established in the future on the renewed earth when Jesus returns. That's the heart of the gospel. But one can read, as I've had the opportunity to do, doing this as a job, I've had the opportunity of reading a lot of books on this, Evangelical tracts in church foyers and bookstores, even evangelical scholarly literature on the gospel, without finding a single reference to the gospel of the kingdom of God, much less any explanation of what that kingdom means. And yet we say we love Jesus. No wonder Jesus raised his voice. Notice he raised his voice for emphasis and insisting that he was useless. He, Jesus, was useless without his own kingdom gospel words. I'm referring there to Luke 8.8. 8. Easy to remember. Luke 8.8, 8, the parable of the sower in Luke. Jesus, when he got to a certain point in the parable of the sower, which is all important, he used to shout. Why then do we not speak the language of Jesus and use his words? No wonder he warned. He was ashamed of me and my words, my words, my words, ashamed of me and my kingdom, kingdom gospel, Mark 8, 35, 38. No wonder, he said, unless you are converted and accept the kingdom of God as a little child, you will not enter it. I hope that those words are really striking you as refreshingly interesting. Matthew 18, 3, Mark 10, 15, and see verse 26. Jesus said, whoever does not receive the kingdom message as a child will not enter it, will not be saved. Wow, that is a real Mozart of theology. He knew his Bible and he explained it in a devastatingly interesting and logical way. So the Bible story from start to finish is a royal book. It's about the royal family. Jesus will be King Jesus the first and only. It's about the destiny of the world and about your personal royal destiny. Have you taken in the fact that Daniel in Daniel 1.3 was a member of the royal family or maybe the nobility, the sons of the kingdom, literally the seed of the kingdom, the royal family. Jesus was all about the seed or family of the kingdom. He was choosing and training kings and queens to rule in the future kingdom. No wonder then that Jesus in his most fundamental parable, the parable of the sower, spoke of the seed gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 13, Mark 4 and Luke 8. He spoke of the good seed as the royal family, the sons of the kingdom, the royal family. Jesus as the king of the kingdom, was on a mission with the task of planting, sowing the royal family, the good seed, the seed of the royal family. If there's going to be a kingdom, then that kingdom needs kings to function in it. Churches have for centuries been telling you the fake news that your destiny is to go to heaven, to depart from the earth as a disembodied soul. They should have been telling you that Jesus has elected you if, on condition that, you first believe and obey his gospel of the kingdom. You are in training now to be, to function as the kings of the kingdom, the royal family. So don't tell me, well, if I can just hold the door for a thousand years, I'll be happy. Don't say that. God is more excited about your talent and what you're going through by way of training than you are. Evangelicals have been given half the gospel. Churches are told that the gospel means that Jesus did get this quote from Billy Graham, three days work to die, to be buried and to rise. And I say that's not the whole gospel. Jesus did three days work? I don't think so. What an insult. So Billy Graham's definition, 
again, nothing personal against him, but I'm hoping that you will write to the Billy Graham organization and gently and politely challenge them on this subject. What he's presenting is a half gospel. And it misses out on the beginning and the foundation of the gospel in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The very first command of Jesus is to us. And salvation is obtained by obeying Jesus. That's Hebrews 5, 9. I should have had it in there. Hebrews 5, 9. Salvation comes by obeying Jesus. Hebrews 5, 9. Here's the command. Repent, an imperative, a command, and believe that gospel about the kingdom. The devil knows very well that the gospel is firstly and foundationally about the kingdom of God and the royal family. Salvation is obtained by believing the gospel about the kingdom, in addition, of course, to the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Billy Graham half gospel tries to keep the gospel of the kingdom out of sight. Some so-called dispensationalist systems explicitly say that the gospel of the kingdom is not for you today, it's only for Jews. It doesn't get any worse than that. Such is straight false prophet stuff. Finally, they say that the gospel for us now is the gospel of grace. Dispensationists say that. It's fundamentally false. All you have to do is to read Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, to correct that fatal misunderstanding. To be a Christian is to become royal family, kings, priests, destined in the future to rule and reign as kings with Jesus. That's the grand goal of the faith. Be a son of the kingdom, Matthew 13, is the same as being the seed of the kingdom. The New American Standard Version, many translations correctly render this as royal family, as in Daniel 1.3. Popular evangelism is very keen to tell you about the work. Please get this very easy distinction here about the work of Jesus. That's to say, dying to forgive you. But they've not told you about the words of Jesus. You get it? The work of Jesus, yes, he died for me. Fine, all correct. They don't hear about the words of Jesus, his invitation to you to become royal family and help him to rule the world when he comes back. Jesus knew who he was and what his destiny was. He said this, I was born to be king. That's why I came into the world, John 18. Nathaniel was amazed to discover, you can hear the excitement as you read this text, he discovered who Jesus was. You are the king of Israel, John 1, 49. Here, breathless excitement. We found the Messiah, the Christ, the king, John 1, 41. Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. If you meet a real Christian, you can say, you are the royal family, selected and elected to rule and administer the world with Jesus. You are co-heirs with Jesus. What he inherits, you inherit with him. Revelation 2, 26, 27 is blatantly clear. Sons of the kingdom are the princes and princesses, the royal family. Here's how Jesus worked. He was a king. He'd read about that future king and also rulers in the plural, as in Jeremiah 33, 26. So Jesus reproduced himself, not physically, since he was not married, but spiritually by sowing the seed of the kingdom, that's to say other members of the royal family like himself. Hebrews says that Jesus had children. You probably didn't know that. Look it up. Jesus had children. How was that? It was by evangelizing others with the gospel of the kingdom, which he called the seed message in the primary parable of the sower. Okay, move that up a little bit for me, if you would, please. That of the sower. He needed assistant kings and princes to rule the world with him at his future return. Is that not a privilege, as Peter said? I'm finishing here, 1 Peter 2, verse 7. This supreme honor, badly translated in the New American Standard Version, oh, the Greek there says, this supreme honor is for you Christians who believe. And notice 1 Peter 1, verse 7. This praise, glory, and honor is for you. The translators are shy of this. You're just all wretched sinners. You're nothing. I get that. But God is going to give praise, glory, and honor to you 
if you endure to the end, for those who refuse to believe, though the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. If you refuse to believe the gospel of the kingdom, you're going to be cast aside. So finally, First Peter 2 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may announce, and this is your task now, write to the Billy Graham Association and get them into a discussion of how to define the gospel, so that you may announce the excellency, the excellence of him, God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So finally, I hope that these reflections will strengthen your understanding of what the Christian faith is all about. So do let me know how you get on with explaining these marvelous kingdom truths to your friends and anybody else. Okay, Tracy, there we are. Thank you, Anthony. That was magnificent. It's like one of your best works, I think. Good, I, I hope that everybody will share this with yeah. other people. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you go to a church or you have Bible studies, Please. encourage people to work through this and read through it. I, I think pastors could take this and stand up with your notes and preach the same message <laughs> to their you. churches. <laughs> Good, Tracy. Yeah, thank Good. you so much. And you thank said, you. how old did you say you were? 87? 87, yeah, getting on 88. So if Anthony at 87 can put together such marvelous work, <laughs> at least we could do is share it. Amen. And you're doing that too. Don't say you're trying. You're succeeding. I want to hear you say it. You're succeeding. Well done. Yeah. Okay, Anthony, great. we have a few questions yes, here, if good. we may. Um, so let's see from Terry. What will it look like mm. to give an account of every word and deed before the judgment seat of Christ? Great question, isn't it? I mean, that's very challenging. I think God is a bit tougher than we imagine, you know. We're going to have to give every, we're going to have to explain why we said so and so, why we didn't say so and so before the judgment seat. I appreciate very much the work that Terry Robinson does, by the way. He sees the point of this, but I think that would make one rather cautious about what one said and did every day, wouldn't it? That judge is a lot tougher than we imagine. We, you know, we imagine God as an old doddery guy in the sky who approves of everything we do. That may turn out not to be true. So you guard your tongue, masses of verses on that, and you try to think and do uh, a kingdom lifestyle, of course, now. Great I question. think your point, Anthony, too, not only what do you say, but what don't you say? Good point. What you don't, oh, that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that. We've often said it's what you don't say that gives you away. Billy Graham quotes Mark 1, 14 and 15. He says, repent and believe. He doesn't even put dot, dot, dot. My dear Billy, I want to say to you, do you realize somebody's fooling you here? You didn't quote the rest of that verse. You just said repent and believe. You didn't put dot, dot, dot. You just left it out. Come on now. God may hold you accountable for that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Michelle asks, and I know she knows the answer, but she sometimes oh, yeah. asks for other people, their yes, benefit. Lord. Anthony, please explain what will happen right after Jesus returns. What's going to happen after his yes. return? So many people just stop there, and they really don't know much yes. about the kingdom after. Well, it's going to take a while to get this world under control. You know the chaos we're in now. So Mark, uh, Psalm 2 is key. You know, Psalm 1 is an introductory psalm. It says, walking and standing and sitting, you better meditate on the Bible all day long, morning, noon, and night. So Psalm 2 is really the first psalm. Guess what is of interest to God there in giving us that psalm? Psalm number two. Why are the nations so furious about this Messiah who's arrived telling us what to do? We don't want this man to rule over us. Thank you. And then he who sits in heaven, God and Jesus, and or Jesus back on the earth by that time, his feet will have stood on the Mount of Olives. He arrived and God warns them, you nations, you stupid people. Why don't you give in to my son? Because he's got all the power in the universe. You either give in or you perish. So it's a wonderful messianic psalm. Now, I'm not recommending that we do that now. It's not for us Christians to be violent now. I get that. But we better be aware that there is a violent side to Jesus. Those people who don't want me to reign over him, he said there in Luke 17, bring them in front of me and slaughter them. Did you hear that? Slaughter them 
in my presence. My goodness, this Bible is a pretty amazing book. Good wow. question. Yeah. Uh, Jim asks, how will the mortal subjects of the kingdom be chosen and yes. what criteria? Well, we have to be upon the base of repentance. Some people are smart enough. They're going to get the point. And they're going to repent. And God will have mercy upon them because they change their minds. And they will not be victims or they will not be recipients of the killing power of Jesus. They're not going to be done away with if they're repenting. So I don't know how many thousands that's uh, going to be. I do know that the end of the millennium, and this was pointed out to me just the other week, it says that people as numerous as the sands of the seas are going to rebel at the end of the millennium. Now, it doesn't mean the whole millennium is destroyed. It doesn't. The last generation, some of them, living at the end, because if you live to be 100 years old, you'll be considered just a youth. So people will have enormous longevity. I get that. But even then... The human race is still so stupid, it's going to rebel in that last generation. So that's the end of the millennium. At the beginning, it will be entirely based on, are you going to repent and accept the gospel of the kingdom when Jesus is right here? If you do, you're going to be allowed mercifully into that society as a mortal with the aspect and, and chance of gaining immortality, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of you mentioned that battle at the end. A lot of people forget that there are two battles. There's Armageddon when Jesus returns, where the false yes. prophet and Antichrist are thrown yes. into the lake of fire. That's and then right. that one you mentioned at the end of the millennium, yes. where Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. That's exactly right. Only the beast and the false prophet are thrown alive into the lake of fire, which will exist at the second coming. Later on, then, Satan is also destroyed, I believe. These are awfully grim, but subjects which we must face up to, if we're going to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. We have a question from your hardworking son-in-law here. What is the sign of the parousia, the end of the age in Matthew 24, 3? And oh, like yes. Michelle, I'm sure he's asking. Yes, what's the sign? Than... How can we tell when the, the parousia is close? Well, he gives a whole list of things. That uh, question reads, what's the sign of your parousia and end of the age. It's the same thing. The second coming is the end of the age. And Jesus gives a number of signs in terms of uh, terrible chaos and apostasy. But then he says, when you see the AFD, the abomination of desolation, that horrible person standing in the temple with the definite article, almost certainly I would say a real temple building. We haven't got that yet. When you see that, then you know that the end is going to be very close because that will trigger the Great Tribulation, which has never been as bad as that, from Daniel 12, verse 1. And after that, then they will see the Son of Man coming in power and glory. So until you've got a temple in the Middle East, although I do think the Middle East situation is potentially quite threatening. It may well be, but we're not setting any dates. So I want to do that. But the AFD standing where he, where he ought not to, Mark 13, 14, not it, but he, it's a person in a temple, then watch out. Flee to the mountains if you happen to be in Jerusalem and hunker down and get through that time of great tribulation. After that comes the parousia itself. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Anthony, and thank you so much for your service and continued service. And um, as Paul says that uh, it gives him joy to see his children are walking in the truth. Yes. And I think as we mentioned, uh, yeah. uh, Pastor Edwin shared that yes. uh, you're a father-like figure to him. And there were many people on the yeah. chat saying the same thing. And I know for myself and for mm -hmm. our dear sister, Wendy, who's going to be up next, you have Wonderful. been a, a great teacher and um, thank you. have helped many people. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you for organizing this conference, Tracy. Mm -hmm. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.